What's up you guys, I'm Dan, this is Frugal Not Cheap, and today we'll learn about options. Before I begin, for those of you who don't know, my job is to run a trading book for a small proprietary shop. We trade over-the-counter commodity swaps and options on swaps, and I hedge our exposure on the NYMEX exchange and also with uh, bilateral agreements with counterparties over-the-counter. So I buy and write options on the exchange and over-the-counter every day. Much like with the recent Bitcoin video, <laughs> um, a friend had mentioned to me that he was trying a covered call strategy. And so that got me thinking I want to make a video about covered calls and what I think about them. But before we can talk about a specific option strategy, we first need to talk about what options are and how they work. So in this week's video, we'll do that. It'll be a primer on options. We'll start talking about options and how they work. And then in next week's video, we'll apply what we've learned today onto a particular strategy, in this case, the covered call strategy for income generation. All right, so what are options? Options are a financial instrument that grants the holder the right to buy or sell an asset at a specified price at a specified time. But this right does not come with the obligation to do so. So it's the right to buy or sell, but not the obligation. In the case of my job, the asset that we're talking about is a futures contract on commodities. So that's a contract to buy or sell um, a specified quantity of a specified commodity at a specified time. <laughs> I keep saying specified because the idea is that all of these contracts that are traded on an exchange anyway, the over-the-counter ones can have um, some variability because you're just coming up an agreement between two parties. But the ones that are on the exchange are highly standardized. And so um, all this stuff is predetermined ahead of time. And the only thing that's left is price. So for instance, the primary contract that I trade is the ultra low sulfur diesel or ULSD futures contract. And this specifies delivery at New York Harbor. It specifies the amount of uh, volume, which is 42,000 gallons. Um, that's because 42 gallons makes one barrel. Um, yeah, that goes to the back to the Rockefeller days. Anyway, so you've got the volume that's specified. Of course, we know that the product is specified as well. And then the other factor, of course, is time. So these futures contracts um, usually expire. The, well, for you, let's see the futures contracts expire through on the last trading day of the month. And if you hold on to the futures contract beyond that point, then you'll have to take delivery at New York Harbor uh, the following month. So that's all specified on the futures contract, which means that of course, when we have an option on a futures contract, this gives us the right to buy futures or sell a futures, but not the obligation, then all that stuff is going to be um, specified as well and preset. The only thing that remains is the price. And when we talk about options, of course, the price is uh, the premium. When you hear the word premium, you might be thinking about your auto or home insurance policy premiums. And actually that makes a whole lot of sense. In fact, if you're doing what my clients at work do, which is to hedge price risk, then you really are buying a kind of insurance. You're buying price insurance. Here's an example to explain. Let's say that you're Southwest Airlines, and I picked them because they famously have a very strong hedging program. But we're gonna simplify things <laughs> a whole lot, and we're gonna just have uh, one, one airplane and one flight, right? Um, and to further simplify it, we've already sold uh, all of the seats. So the flight is full and we know exactly how much our revenues are going to be. But of course, in order to get going, we're gonna have to fill up the plane with jet fuel. If there's a big jump in jet fuel prices between the time that we sold all of the seats and the time that we need to buy the jet fuel, then that's gonna eat into our margins, right? We'll make less money if the jet fuel price goes way, way up. So we can hedge in order to try to protect us from this price risk. One way to do that is simply to get a fixed price on our jet fuel. So that would be buying a futures on jet fuel. Um, really, it's the ULSD futures that we would buy. That's the contract that's most clo closely correlated with jet fuel that's very active on NYMEX and the one that I trade every day. All right, so let's say that we buy some jet fuel futures at, oh, I don't know, $2.50 a gallon. If we do that and the price goes up by, say, 50 cents, then we'll make money, right? We'll make 50 cents versus our original position because the market price will have gone up by 50 cents, but we'll be able to continue to pay the lower price of 250 instead of the current market price of $3. Conversely, however, if the price falls by 50 cents, we'll be stuck paying 250, while everyone else is paying only $2 a gallon, and so we'll have missed out or lost 50 cents. So what could we do instead? Instead, we could buy what's called a call option. 
A call option would give us the right, but not the obligation, to buy the jet fuel at $2.50 a gallon. In this case, we're setting the price, what's called the strike price for the option, equal to the market price, which is called an at-the-money option. Okay, so if the market price rises, then our call option gives us the right to buy the jet fuel at $2.50 a gallon, and so we're protected against increases in the market price. But if the market price falls instead, then all we need to do is not exercise our option, because obviously we don't want to buy the jet fuel at 250 gallon if the market price is say $2 or something. And so we'll simply allow the um, option to expire. We just won't exercise it. The other type of an option is what's called a put option. So if we were a refiner, say, and we had a bunch of jet fuel in our inventory and we wanted to protect against falling prices, um, then we would use a put option and that would give us the right to sell at a specified price called the strike price. All right, back to our call option. So again, this allowed us to um, be protected against increases in the price, but also um, allowed us to benefit from decreases in the market price. Sounds amazing, right? What's the catch? Well, just like with your auto and home insurance uh, policies, there is a premium that we have to pay in order to offload this risk to someone else. So essentially that's what an option does. The option writer, the person who, who writes the option and charges the premium, is taking the risk on from someone else who's buying the option and offloading the risk off to them. So just like the actuaries at the auto and home insurance companies work very hard to make sure that the premiums are going to adequately price in the risk of covering you under their policy, much the same way traders like myself are pricing options in order to adequately account for the amount of risk that we're taking on by writing that option. We all use variations on a closed form solution to a differential equation developed by Black, Scholes, and Merton, which defines the option pricing. They developed a model for options pricing. Actually, they won a Nobel Prize for this in 1997, um, and all of us call it the Black-Scholes model. I'm not sure why Merton got the shaft on the name, but anyway, it's the Black-Scholes model. And I'll be going into the details of that model a little bit more later on, but suffice to say, we have a model that helps us to accurately price these options premiums. So we've got to pay a premium for our option. Let's say that option premium is 10 cents. And to make things simple, let's say that the strike price in the current market price is a dollar a gallon. Let's see what happens if the price goes up by 50 cents and down by 50 cents using a chart that I use every day at work to think about options. So on the x-axis here, we have the price of jet fuel and the current price is a dollar and we have a dollar 50 on the right and 50 cents on the left. On the y-axis, we have the profitability of our strategy, so our payout, uh, in dollars per gallon. First, let's see if we just use a futures contract. So we're gonna buy jet fuel futures at a dollar a gallon. If the market goes up by 50 cents, we bought our jet fuel at a dollar a gallon, and the current market price is now $1.50, so we've made 50 cents a gallon effectively. If the market falls by 50 cents, then we're stuck paying a dollar a gallon while everyone else is paying 50 cents, and so we've lost 50 cents this time. Okay, so how about using the call option? Well, it costs us 10 cents to get the option, so we've got to put that premium, and so our starting point is going to be 10 cents lower. We've got a $1 strike on the call option, so if the price goes anywhere up above a dollar, then we'll start to um, be paid off one-to-one -one for any increases in the market price, because we still get to buy at $1. So if the price goes up to $1.50, we're still going to pay a dollar because we'll exercise our right to buy at a dollar and we'll make 50 cents, but we've lost 10 cents on the premium, so we'll make an additional 40. Now, if the market falls though, we don't have to exercise this right to buy. We'll just buy it at the market and all we lost out on is the 10 cents. So effectively, we've limited the downside. We've limited our losses to just 10 cents while we've created unlimited upside if the market were to continue to spike. I don't know about you, but I think this looks a whole lot better than it did with the fixed price futures. So hopefully you're starting to see how for the cost of an option premium, we can hedge our risk in terms of price fluctuations. So that was the call option. Why don't we look at a put option? Whereas the call option helped to protect us against increase in prices, the put option can help to protect us against declines in the prices. In this case, let's say that we're a refiner and we have some pretty big tanks on our property and they're full of jet fuel that we want to sell. If the market price falls by 50 cents, we'll have to sell our current jet fuel at 50 cents cheaper than it is now. And so we'll be losing those 50 cents. 
Conversely, if the market price goes up by 50 cents, then we're going to be able to make 50 cents more than we could have right now. Okay, so now let's look at the put option, which is gonna give us the right to sell our jet fuel at the current market price. So we'll have lost the 10 cents a gallon in option premium at the very start. But if the price falls, we get to sell the jet fuel at the strike price, and so we are protected against those. We'll only lose the 10 cents in the option premium. But if the price instead increases, then we'll be able to sell at the higher market price, just not exercise our put option, and we'll continue to benefit. So again, you can see here that we have limited our losses while keeping our gains unlimited. But you might be thinking, what if the option premium were much larger, like say a dollar a gallon, 10 times bigger? If the market had to fall by a dollar a gallon before our put option started paying off, then it probably wouldn't really be worth it. It'd be way too expensive, and we might be more likely to just take the risk on ourselves and self-insure. And this begs the question of just exactly how options are priced. There are lots of resources out there. In fact, even just the Wikipedia on Black Scholes is pretty good. Uh, there's a bunch of YouTube videos as well. So I'd encourage you to do some more research, but what we'll do now is just a primer. So we won't go too far into the details, but I'd like to give you an idea, um, some of the intuition for how options are priced. So we've got a number of factors or inputs into the model, right? And in the Black Scholes model, all of these inputs or factors are denoted by Greek letters. So you'll hear a bunch of those, but I think it's much more important to remember uh, what they stand for, what the factor is, and how it relates to the price of the option, than just remembering the Greek letters, right? It's just jargon. Okay, so the first one we have is delta, and this relates to the price of the underlying asset, right? So it's actually, it's a ratio um, that tells us how much will the options price move as the price of the underlying asset uh, changes. So this ratio goes between zero and one. And uh, for commodities like ULSD, um, when you're talking about at the money call options, you're right in the middle between zero and one at 0 0.5. And then for put options, you're at negative 0 0.5 is your delta because they go um, opposite directions like we talked about. Anyway, the main thing to take home there though is of course that the price of the underlying asset um, is going to be a factor in the options price as well, right? That makes sense. Um, so that's delta. Then the second one we have is called gamma, and this talks about um, how quickly the options premium is going to change as the price of the underlying asset changes at a point. So for those of you that are calculus nerds like me, <laughs> um, you, you can think of this as the second derivative of the equation with respect to the price of the underlying asset. So the second derivative with respect to price gives you um, an idea of the rate of change right at that point. But for today's video, that's probably not all that important. More important will be the next few. So the next one, um, which is quite big, is called Vega. And what's nice is it's a V, so it's easy to remember. It stands for volatility. So obviously, if prices uh, are pretty stable, then there's not a whole lot of risk there in insuring against the, the prices, right? And so the options premium should be lower. But if we have a very volatile asset, like, I don't know, Tesla prices, for instance, <laughs> they're pretty volatile, then uh, the options premium is going to be much larger. So yeah, volatility is positively related to the options premium. Then we have Rho, and this one begins with R, and it helps me to remember that it's the risk-free rate. Uh, but really, this is just the opportunity cost. So any investment that we're going to make, there is an opportunity cost. There's our next best alternative that we could be doing. And in the case of the options, the money could, instead of just been socked away, like in an interest-bearing asset, something very, very safe, right? Um, and that would have provided some return as well. And so baked into the options premium must be this next best alternative, uh, which is the risk-free interest rate. And then finally, we have theta. So theta begins with T, and that helps me to remember that it is time. And so, of course, if there's a long time between now and the time when our option is going to expire, uh, then our option will be more valuable. Whereas if the option is going to expire tomorrow, there's just less time for things to happen, and so it's going to be less valuable, all else equal. So that's the final one. That's theta for time. We could dive into the details on all of these and talk about how theta decays in a predictable but nonlinear fashion and all this kind of stuff, but that's really beyond the scope. I just wanted to give you um, a quick rundown of primer and options, give you uh, some intuition for uh, why options might be more expensive or less expensive uh, depending on these factors. 
If you're interested, I encourage you to do further research on your own, and I may in the future do some more videos that dive a little bit deeper as well. Anyway, next week we'll apply what we learned today to a common option strategy for generating income, which is called the covered call strategy. Hopefully you found today's video helpful. If you did, please hit the like button. If you'd like to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button. If you'd like YouTube to let you know when new videos are posted, hit the notification bell icon. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.